Hello, and welcome to the Christian Habits Podcast. This is the podcast that will help you break free from your strongholds, draw closer to God, and develop habits that will help you love God and others better. And now, here's your host, Barb Raveling. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have all of you here. I hope you are enjoying some beautiful fall weather and fall leaves. We are loving autumn in New England. We've never experienced that, and it is just gorgeous hiking up here. So we're excited about that. When you listen to this podcast, we'll be less than two weeks out from the publishing of my book, Say Goodbye to Emotional Eating. So uh, if you pre-order that book, make sure you get in on the fun pre-order bonuses. Go to saygoodbyetoemotionaleating.com to sign up for those. Okay, let's get to today's episode of the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. I am so excited today to have Jennifer Slattery here. And Jennifer is an author, she's a speaker, a ministry leader, and she is the lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Hi, thank you for inviting me on. Thanks for you being here. And I first found Jennifer, uh, I saw an article she did on idols, on common idols. So I wanted to do a podcast on idolatry. I thought, well, Jennifer will be the perfect one to uh, interview for that. So Jennifer, can you start out by telling us what is an idol? Wow. So I think that's kind of a, a complex question, but really it's a, I would say it's a matter of the heart and it, it's anytime we, we seek something else to give us what God should be giving us. So whether that's security or comfort or, or fulfillment when we're seeking those things outside of God. I'd probably quote Tim Keller. He from in his book Counterfeit Gods, he said an idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. Okay, that's good. And so uh that with that definition then how how would you identify it? Would you just keep going back to the definition or is there some easy way to tell what kind of idols we have in our lives? Well, for me personally, I think we are such, (laughs) humans are so self-deceived. It's really hard for us to recognize what really drives us. And so idols, there's always, it's, they really, I could boil them down to an idol of self. And so it's, it's when we're kind of elevating ourselves, but for me personally, I just pray, Lord, examine my heart and show me what is getting in your way. And so I think for each person, it's going to be different, but if we always take it to Christ, then not only are we going to be more alert to our idols, but then we're also going to be given steps to overcome them and to really heal. A lot of times there's, there's some kind of trigger or, or what I would call an inner lie an emotional wound beneath our idols. Okay. That's good. And I know your ministry, um, it's called Holy Love Ministry. You, you actually talk about some of those things in your ministries, right? And help people find them. So why do you think it's important to identify our idols? You know, I was really thinking about, as I was kind of praying over our conversation today, I had, and thinking of the analogy of marriage, and there's a verse in Jonah 2, 8 that talks about those who cling to worthless idols, they forsake the steadfast love of God. And, and some translations say they abandon, they turn away from. And I just think in my marriage, it, anytime I am focusing on something and, and that is filling that role in my marriage, right? Like if, if you think of, of when people have affairs, right? And, and why is that so damaging. It's damaging because they are then their attention is diverted where they should be investing in their marriage and building that intimacy. Their trust is is undermined, is decreased. So they're not able to build the trust. There's no security. And and throughout scripture, God, we, we see a picture of God's children. He relates to us kind of like a marriage, right? And so when we are focusing on these other things that we should be getting from Christ, not only are we not turning to Christ, and so we're depleting ourselves of the fulfillment, the love, the care, the guidance, everything that we're meant to get in Christ, and then we're running after. So we're always living depleted, but the more depleted we are, the more we run after that thing, which kind of strengthens the idolatry in our hearts. 
Right. Which takes us away from God, right? Because just as in a marriage, if you're always running after that affair person, you're going to kind of fall out of love with the regular person. Um, the adultery is not going to help. So what if, I know we're going to talk about how to let go of the idols, but let's first talk about the common idols. I know you've identified nine common idols. Why don't you go through some those and, and tell us what these common idols are so we can see if we have any of those. Absolutely. I think a big one, especially for women, is the idol of security. And so we can fill that in so many ways. We can maybe seek after that career, that job. We place that as our mode of security, or maybe it's our paychecks, or maybe it's our home. But but really, the underlying root is the need for security that we're seeking to fill with something other than Christ. Yeah, I could see that. So financial security. I also noticed that as you get closer to retirement, sometimes that becomes more important because you know you're not going to have that income anymore. So and something that wasn't an idol when you were younger might become an idol later even, I've noticed. Yeah, and I think the more we chase after that thing, so we know inherently, like internally, that that's insufficient. We, we recognize that we could lose our job or there could be a recession or you know something could happen to our home. And so that keeps us in a place of, of fear and actually increases our insecurity, which is interesting. We're, we're chasing after that thing for security, but the more we chase after that thing, the more insecure we feel, which just keeps us grasping. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, what's a, a second idol? So I would say another one is the idol for approval. And, and I think, you know, when you look at these idols, they all stem from a God-given need, but we're just going about filling it in the wrong way. And if we can recognize like God gave us these needs. So like with approval, we have a God-given need for community Mm -hmm. and to belong and and to feel accepted. And and that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do, right? When we, we get that first from Jesus, and then we get that with our faith communities, and so that that would be a healthy way, but it becomes an idol when we start chasing after these these things and we seek those first and above God. And then again, it leaves us depleted and we can put our desire to be liked over our relationship with God, which then can cause us to live in disobedience. Okay, that's good. So how do we seek after the approval idol in unhealthy ways? So why I had a, a mom one time reach out to me and she had a teenager who was not living in a very healthy manner. Mm-hmm. And the mom was so afraid of losing that relationship of that approval from her daughter that she was unable to have hard conversations with her. Or you you could see it as, so if somebody has in a marriage and they feel like they're not, they they're, they come depleted because anytime we're not filling our needs with Christ, we will automatically de- be depleted. And so they're constantly seeking to get that in their, in their spouse. And so they, their spouse will maybe dictate everything they do all day, or maybe they will be so in tune to, to his body language or facial expressions that they're constantly thinking, well, he doesn't love me. All of those things I think have their root in, I feel I, I feel I lack and I'm seeking that that sense of approval from others. And again, so then I just keep coming to them with an empty bucket, looking for them to fill it. So I, I would think it looks, you know, those are some of the ways I think it varies based on the relationship and the individual. Right. And if we're tuning to those things for idols, we never get enough to satisfy us. So you could have a very loving spouse who's giving you all that feedback. But if you, if you're counting on them, that love is your idol. It's like, you never get enough to satisfy you. And that can hurt the relationship too, which is kind of interesting. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think really the solution is just, again, we, we bring it to God and we say, Lord, why, why is that person's opinion so important to me? Why am I feeling so? And I, I think if we, we can notice, if we begin to feel anxious, like this inner angst, then that's a that's an indication. Okay, that something's amiss, okay. and so we can figure out why. Because a lot of times we also in our society, and that's what idols do too, is they numb our emotions. We don't have to deal with our emotions or get to the root of them because we just constantly chase after these things that we think is going to fix it. 
And so just hitting pause and saying in this relationship, why am I thinking about this relationship so much? And why does it affect me so deeply emotionally? And then I sometimes you might find a hurt that that's kind of feeling that or a lie, or maybe we're just not, we're not finding our wholeness in Christ. Yeah, I like that. I think too, um, with the relationships, it helps to remember that even if uh, we fall out of a relationship with that person, God still loves us and God is enough. So to accept what feels unacceptable, that doesn't mean you are going to lose a relationship. But for me, it helps mentally to remember, you know what, God's my number one. It's not this other person. So what about a a third popular idol? So we talked about approval and and you mentioned relationships. I think those are very, very interlinked, but I can share how that, so that has been a constant battle for me as a mom. And and I think it often starts from a healthy, like we love our kids, right? And and that's a a God given and, and deep compassion, I believe is holy, but then it can, we can overstep that where I, I, realized pretty early on that if I was ever going to disobey Jesus, it was probably going to be related to my daughter. Mm. And I, and as she's become an adult, I've had to kind of wrestle with that where she went through a situation where God was calling her to do some really hard and painful and what I felt frightening things. And I found myself putting her comfort, wanting to guide her towards her comfort instead of saying to her, which which Paul said to Timothy in scripture, instead of saying to her, yeah, God calls us to do the hard, right thing. And so I I think that's when it, when I'm like, okay, so I'm wanting her comfort above filling my role as a mom to guide her towards deeper faith in Jesus. I love that because with our kids, I think we automatically tend towards, oh, we want them to be happy. And if we're on that track, we can lead them toward, you know, give them advice that went really be doing what God wants them to do and following, following what the Bible says to do. And I think also if we're, if we're not able to set healthy boundaries, Mm -hmm. then that also is an indication that maybe we've elevated that relationship above God, because we're then we're motivated by fear and kind of that clinging depleted heart instead of saying, okay, Lord, what is a healthy relationship. And and I think we have to look at Jesus provided a perfect example. He loves us unconditionally. He pursues us relentlessly, but he has his boundaries. He's like, for us to have a relationship, you need to, by faith, accept my gift of salvation. And if we don't accept that, he doesn't say, well, that's okay. You know what? You just, you didn't, I I just, we're going to get, I just love you so much. We're going to kind of not allow that boundary because he knows that wouldn't be healthy. And so it's the idea where Jesus loves us so much and is so focused on true health and wholeness that he is willing to allow a person to walk away if they choose not to live in that wholeness. Right. Think of the prodigal son. He let him walk away. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, What's another idol? I would say success, especially if you're in the Western in, in Western culture. And I think, you know, a lot of times you can you can tell if if we are really if if success is an idol, you can tell in a few ways. Does it keep us up at night? That project, that our boss's approval, it, if we introduce ourselves to somebody, is that the first thing we mention? You know, are we really quick to tell them about our our wins and our accomplishments? Or are we focused on being Jesus to them in that situation. So again, it's always something that's going to battle. We're either going to be living surrender to Jesus, or we're going to be living to elevate self, which is kind of all of these idols are, are a God of self, right? And so in those Thanksgiving, Christmas, neighborhood parties, what comes out of our mouth and what do we point others to as trying to be like our identity? or, or to make the, to, to have them respect us. Okay. That's interesting. And you talk about what keeps us up at night. I mean, often what we wake up thinking about and worrying about that sometimes points to our idols, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my first, when my first book came out, it had, I, I received an email from a reader that, that showed me that there were some typos 
And I kind of struggled with that because, you know, it's your first book and you want it to be perfect. And and I, I was praying and walking, you know, just going on a prayer walk with God because I had felt during the editing process, there were times where I felt like, so I personally have to guard my Sabbath. That's one of the ways I keep idolatry. I, I fight against it, even if it means saying, you know what? Yeah, I, I can't get to this project on this day. I I'm, I'm going to have to trust God with it. And so that's what happened. And, and I felt like he said to me, who are you trying to please? And so it was a, it, it was almost like he allowed some typos <laughs> into the book to, to keep me humble and remind me it's not about me or my success or how good I look to others. It's about elevating Christ. And because he knows how I will elevate him, if I do my best to live surrendered to him, then when those things come up, like a failed project or a depleted savings account, whatever we attribute with our success, then it means that's good, that he has good in mind for it because he's sovereign and and all knowing. Yeah, I even notice sometimes it feels like he brings things into our lives. Like if you keep having a trial come up in the same area and over and over again, I feel like sometimes it's God saying, Hey, you're making this more important than I want you to make it. And so take a look at all these things that are happening. You might need to work on uh, letting go of that idol or growing in that area. Yeah, I, I love how Paul, so first century evangelist, he wrote a, a lot of the New Testament. And I just love how in so many of his letters to ancient believers, he seemed to always start with their identity, who they were in Christ. Mm -hmm. And and for me, when I'm struggling with, you know, let's say I, I speak at an event and I completely flub it, or, or I say, you know, sometimes you'll say, you know, on podcasts and you might say something you totally didn't mean and it comes out. (laughs) I like going to Ephesians chapter one, which it talks about us in Christ that we're, we're cherished, we're chosen, we're empowered, we're, we're called to purpose. And, and so just shifting our mind to the truth of who we are in Christ can really help to protect our hearts against the idolatry of success. Oh yeah. I love that. That's good. Okay. So what's another idol? I would say wealth, which probably, I mean, a lot of these are intertwined, right? Right. And Mm -hmm. they all come to seeking to get our needs met out apart from Christ. And I think this one's really, really hard. And, And same with success and approval in our culture, where if we are not constantly fighting against this, I'm so grateful I did I did not raise my daughter in the social media era. I don't know how parents nowadays, you know, how I mean it just feels like the bar keeps raising. And so it's a constant, we're constantly bombarded with the image that we are what we what we produce, right? Basically. And so we we're told like just pull out your credit card. And you're going to have, you know, the commercials and then you're going to have the perfect woman and you're going to have a great life and you're going to feel fulfilled and everyone's going to like you. And, and, but we just, it's kind of, again, that depleted bucket where we're just, then we're just grasping and grasping and grasping after the next thing. Yeah. And like you said, with how things are entwined, I mean, wealth is one of those things It could be, it could mean fun to some people. It could mean security. It could mean you know, buying prestige. So um, they're, they are all kind of uh, intertwined. It's interesting. So I find there's a, a passage in scripture that I think is really relevant when, when we're looking at just the idolatry of wealth. And so scripture tells us about a rich young man who probably had, I mean, had really grown accustomed to having his wealth and relying on that. And that was how he got his needs met. And But something was missing in him because he ran up to Jesus. And he was like, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is in Mark chapter 10. And so Jesus basically is like, you know what? You need to sell what you have and give to the poor and then come follow me. Not because Jesus is like, hey, I just think it's really awesome if you live poor, but because Jesus, you know, he sees our heart. He sees that one thing that will get in the way. And the man walked away and it said that he walked away sad. And I, I just think of like, Something drew him to Jesus, but he wasn't willing to release what he had learned to find fulfillment, security, purpose, and and pleasure, all of those things in. And so then he never found, I think it comes down to 
do we believe? So Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly or, or to the full, which in the original Greek, it's 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 the connotation of like, if you have a, a bucket and you're pouring and it keeps overflowing, like you can't contain it. Mm. Do we believe that's true? And if we believe that's true, do we also believe that the one who died to give us that life and said, you know, I, I give you my peace, I give you my joy. Do we believe that he knows how to do that and that he'll fulfill his promises? That's really what it comes down to. And I think when we look at these idols, we need to bring it back to, do I believe what Jesus said? And and probably one story I would tell with that before I launched Holy Love Ministries, I went through a period in my career where I wasn't sure if I was going to write or speak again. And it, and it felt, it, I, it was, it was very discouraging because I'm like, Lord, I felt like this was your call and I don't know what to do now. You know, I've done it for so long. And then there was a verse. It was, I think it was 140, Psalm 147 verse five that basically said that God's understanding is limitless. And it was like the voice of God in my brain saying, do you really believe I'm all knowing? Do you really believe I love you? And I want what's good for you. And I paused and I said, yes, therefore where I'm at now is good because you're good. And so I was able to relinquish where, you know, what my, my writing, my career turns out, it was just a place where God's like, okay, I want you to launch Holy Love Ministries. And then we move forward again. But it was a reminder to me, who is calling me to this? What's his character and what's his heart for me? And what are his promises? Yeah. And I'm thinking too of the um, story in the New Testament when Jesus was talking to Martha and saying, only one thing is necessary. So really o- only God is necessary. You don't have to have all those things. And I felt the same way too, where over and over again, I have to keep saying, am I going to buy into the whole scripture? Am I really going to believe all of this and act out all of it? Or am I just going to kind of go halfway? And so the, the acting out all of it, it is it involves a giving up, a letting go and sometimes that's painful because you feel like you have to have certain things to be happy. But actually, I remember a friend of ours and a friend of, of his um, had an affair, so a physical affair in his marriage. Um, so somebody I didn't really know. And I remember him saying that he had to um, like fall out of love with this person he was having an affair with. And it was super painful. And that struck me because it never occurred to me, oh, wow, so you're in you're in love. It may, of course, it makes sense, logical sense. You get, you become in love with this person you have an affair with. And if you're going to end it and go back to your wife, you have to fall out of love. You have to get rid of the love. And it's like that with idolatry too. We have an idol. It can be painful letting go of that idol and saying, no, God, we don't need that. And putting God first. Yeah. You know, and back to your marriage analogy. And I was thinking as I was kind of processing through this, I was thinking of in James. And where he said, you know, he said, if you lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give to you generously without finding fault. But you must believe, otherwise you're like a ship tossed on the sea. And I was thinking, so, and he said, you're double-minded. And to be double-minded, it's kind of like to have one foot in faith and one foot in the world. And you can think that if we don't choose God, we will choose whatever feels right or safe or pleasant in the moment. And that does make us unstable, right? Because we are then dependent on our circumstances or other people. And that's, I think that's where the, the cost about like, like a ship on the sea, because God can be speaking to us, but if we've already decided we're only going to listen and we're only going to follow if it fits (laughs) our, our plans, our desires, our comfort level, then his word really means nothing. Or, or maybe, you know, it means something. We love him. We love his word. But, you know, the walking out of that as as frail human beings <laughs> is is hard. <laughs> right. right. Um, okay. So do we have some more idols? I'm not sure how many we've done so far there. Yeah, I think we've done like six. So okay. the health, I think. And I think with all of these, like we talked about in the beginning, they have a good, healthy, pure root. It's when we begin to obsess about that thing and therefore we're not really trusting in God. And and I think a lot of that, I see so many people are fighting for that. I'm going to live forever and I'm going to live like I'm 20 forever and, and fighting aging. And really it's because we don't want to die physically. But then I think if we we look at it and, but what happens if we die physically? 
we spend eternity with Christ, where we know we are are whole and we're going to have unexplainable joy and peace. And so again, it's that going back to that underlying belief that's that's fueling the idol. Do I believe that my fulfillment is found in my health, my physical being today? And and you know, scripture does talk about like we we honor God with our bodies because it's a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we do need to do that. But are we placing that above our hope in eternity? Right. And and are we embracing death? You know, because de- death isn't a bad thing if you're a believer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's sad because you're, you know, your loved ones don't have you there anymore. And the process is sometimes painful. But yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting one. What's uh, What's another one? What's the eighth one? So number eight is food. And I think, you know, you and I were talking actually briefly about just eating disorders in general, like under eating, starvation, anorexia, overeating, compulsive eating, compulsive eating and binging. I think if you were to go to the root of all of those, it is seeking comfort in food or lack of it's it's a numbing that we don't have to deal with our emotions. And so we turn to food when we feel instead of saying, okay, what is going on with me internally? And then how can I seek God's peace in like in my inner mess, in my brokenness or in that relationship brokenness or in that stress, whatever is getting to the root and getting to the truth that counters whatever fear or or numbing or, or suppressing that we're, we're striving for. Yeah. And that's interesting. Cause I know before you had mentioned that you dealt with, um, you know, eating too little, that sort of thing. I, I can't relate to that for, because for me, the numbing involved eating too much. So, so what is it like on that more like anorexia side? I can't quite understand that one. Yeah. So, and I actually had anorexia and bulimia. So I had had both and it was my way of when emotions became too intense. So it started actually when I was in, in a teenager and when I was going through some emotional challenges, I would initially, I was like, Oh, in my brain, I'm like, I'm so strong. Everybody else has to eat. I don't have to eat. And so, but so then my focus is on the hunger I feel and my control over the hunger I feel instead of the out of control feeling I felt in my world. And so I I think it's the same, you know, it's the obsession on whether you're eating it or not eating it, the obsession is still food. And, and it still is that thing that kind of numbs the brain and diverts our attention. And what really broke it for me was when I felt like God just, basically told me this is idolatry. Mm -hmm. And so then it was like, okay, this is sin. Like, this isn't just something I deal with. This is a sin that he wants me to overcome. And why? Because it was destroying me and he calls me to life. And so then I started seeking him to overcome it. And there are a couple of things that was not in a quick and easy solution, or it wasn't like, he just like, okay, now I know. And now I'm better. It was where I daily had to, when, when I was battling thoughts about food and when I was kind of going to my typical way of, of dealing with life through food or starvation or any of those things, each time bring to God. And each time I failed then saying, okay, Lord, I help me in this, but getting to the root of why I was doing those things really helped to break it. Okay. And you did break that, right? You've been living free for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, what broke is food doesn't hold me anymore. Right. And so I, but I also start, so once I realized, okay, this is sin. And again, I'm going to God and this was, you know, decades ago. And so I was, I was relatively new in my faith and really understanding how to fight my battles in Christ. And, and he brought me to the familiar passage of Jesus, when he was tempted in the desert and, you know, how Jesus, every time Satan and Satan actually used food for him too, right? He's like, turn these stones into bread. And, and so every time though, he spoke God's word scripture. And so that's what I began doing when my brain was going towards food and, and with eating disorder, whatever the disorder is, I think there's so much tied up in that, right? Whether it's 
comfort and numbing and approval and belonging. I mean, all of those things. And so I had to kind of get to the root of all of those things. But again, it all comes down to whether I trust or don't trust that God has good for me and and healing. But then I began when I felt that tug or if I would eat and then feel like, okay, I'd blown it and I'm, I'm a terrible, you know, whatever would go on in my brain because I'd associate all these things with food, then speaking scripture out loud and, and literally recognizing that we, we are in a, in a spiritual battle. And so the, our lives, we can, we can have strongholds, spiritual strongholds that we need to break with scripture. And when we speak that out loud, then we defeat our enemy who is trying to destroy us and we walk increasingly towards life. Yeah, that's good. So you could have some Bible verses on hand you could use in those situations. Well, I, I actually put them on note and I still do actually have all over my desk. I put them on note cards mm-hmm. and I put them in my pocket and I would tape them to the microwave and on the dashboard of the car. And I so everywhere I went, I would see whatever the verse, I would choose one verse to speak to that current battle. And then I would recite it out loud and then also cemented it in my heart as well. Oh, I love that. Okay. That's good. There's power in the word. (laughs) Okay. So uh, the last one, what's the last common idol you have for us? So uh, the last one would be intellect. And and I would probably, I mean, as with all these, again, there, there can be a holy God given root. So I connect with Jesus really digging into scripture and, and that's, that's a really intimate experience for me. It becomes an idol when I'm using my intellect to impress others as one, Mm-hmm. Or again, you can use that to numb emotions. So like if you're at if if you're at a Bible study group or a, a faith community and and they're asking questions that maybe are going to go deep into emotion and you want to bring it back to why well, learn this verse. So that's intellectualizing. So you're going, you're uncomfortable with the emotion. And so you're switching to the the more intellectual. Another example would be this happens a lot when you're when you're communicating with non-Christ followers about the gospel. And if they begin to feel uncomfortable, a lot of times they'll bring it back to an intellectual conversation, you know, whether it's like statistics of scripture, whatever they think, you know, whatever article they've read or whatever. And, and a lot of times it's because they're guarding that heart issue. And, and so instead of, again, dealing with the emotion or trying to find our sense of identity in our intellect. So those are a couple ways that it that it can become an idol. That's fascinating. I've never really thought about that intellect. So I would think also in a Bible study, if somebody you know goes into intellectualism talk, it can also keep them from being vulnerable and sharing what their own weaknesses are or, or admitting those when we we need to share those a lot of time to help each other get over them. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's just finding safe community where, you know, where you try a little and you share a little and you see how people respond. And is that a safe community that I can, I can be vulnerable in and not every community is actually. um, But, but I think being aware of when you're doing that and so that you can make some conscious decisions while walking with Jesus. So you're like, Lord, I'm, this is, I go into this situation. This is what I tend to do. Show me how to live differently. Okay. Boy, you've given us so many uh, uh, ideas there. And actually with each, each idol you shared, you actually gave us some practical tips on how to let go of those idols. So do you have any overall tips that would, um, you know, affect all those idols or do we just go back and look at each segment of our, the interview to see what to do for each one of those areas? Well, again, I would just bring it back to Jesus because I think we all have an underlying root. But there is a prayer that David, ancient Israel, second king, where after he had been, he'd, he'd sinned in some pretty, pretty big ways. And so in Psalm 51, he said, restore to me the joy of my salvation and give me a steadfast spirit to sustain me. I think that's an amazing prayer for no matter what we're experiencing, but Restore to me the joy of my salvation tells me God wants me to experience joy in him. And I think a lot of us can remember, not everybody has kind of that that dramatic coming to faith story, but a lot of us do remember where we understood salvation for the first time. 
And it was like the the world suddenly turned multicolor <laughs> and, and everything felt, you know, we just experienced this deep joy. And so it's, Lord, bring me back to that moment when I first realized you were my everything. And then give me a steadfast spirit. Help me to focus on you persistently and consistently and, and make me aware when I'm not doing that. Yeah, I love that. And I think sometimes too, we... We have that joy. We're walking in the joy, living in it. And then a new, a new trial pops up in our lives when we haven't had before. And we have new temptations of sin and new struggles with idolatry that we didn't have before, before that trial started. So even that can help us remember, you know, go back to, you know, remember my joy, you know, bring me back to, you know, my, the purity of my love for you. I love that. It's like, you almost have to learn how to walk with God. Yeah. through each circumstance like what's the path through the forest to be close to him in the midst of whatever is happening in life right now right yeah well I, I think too we have to for me it's it's helpful if I pause to think of what that thing is costing me mm, so good. like with my eating disorder it cost me to not enjoy family dinners it it cost me my peace I was anxious it when we turn to these idols, it, it dulls our spiritual hearing. So we're less able to hear God's voice. It, it leads to depraved thinking. The more we turn from God, the more confused our thoughts become. And so I think if we, again, I want to go back to that John 10 verse 10 at the beginning of that verse, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come to give you life and give it to, to the full. And if we can just in our brain recognize that Every act of disobedience leads to increased decay, dysfunction, and death and robs us of everything that God died to give us, Christ died to give us. And every act of obedience leads to fullness of life. Then I think if we keep that in our thoughts, I so my team, I mailed them this about a year ago, I mailed them all a compass. It was a little from, from Oriental trading. And I, I actually borrowed the idea. I don't know if you've ever read anything by Steve Carter, but he was a a podcast guest and he talked about finding your true North. Mm -hmm. And so I sent them all a a compass with Proverbs 4, 25 to 26, which says basically to keep, I mean, just to keep our, our eyes straight ahead. And so I sent that to everyone and, and I'm like, keep it in your pocket. And that will help you remember at each moment, What is your true north? What is the way to live for Jesus and live in Jesus in this moment? Yeah, I love that. You know, I think of the verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. And and then the fruit of the spirit comes with walking with them. Because when we pursue all those other things, we think we need them to be happy. But like you mentioned throughout the podcast, they don't make us happy. (laughs) When we pursue them, they lead to the consequences you talk about. So I think realizing all that maybe it, it that's what we need to realize to have the strength to give it give those things up we feel like we have to have make the corrections do the obedience that's yeah. good yeah. well i feel like i need to listen to this uh interview over again <laughs> for my own walk with god so i will be doing that why don't you let uh, everybody know where they can find you online jennifer sure so i mean you could just go to jennifer slattery lives out loud that's my personal website and then I actually, I am part of two podcasts. One is the Faith Over Fear podcast that with my team, my team and I lead that. And then also I'm part of the Your Daily Bible Verse podcasting team. So you can find those on Life Audio or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And you can find me on social media too. So I'm not, I I lost my Facebook account. And so it's, it's um, but you can find me there. Okay, we'll include links to in the show notes this episode. And also with some of those things you talked about on here, do you like if somebody want to help with some of those things? Could they contact you? Or is there anything at your website sure. where they could contact and get help? Sure. So actually we have, so we're a team of 30 and we are very, we, we want to create safe places where people can experience healing, freedom, and growth really to live in our heart is that they would live in the full freedom of Christ. And there's a lot of different ways, different avenues we have. We have online groups, Bible study groups that you can participate. We've got private support groups on in Facebook where it's very targeted. One is the faith over fear 
community group and we have people who are intentionally like investing in that group and speaking life to that group. So I would say if you go to my website or if you, uh, there's a contact page on there as well. So absolutely you can contact us and all of our content, we have Bible study books and stuff. All of that is free. We make available for free. So you can contact me for, for that as well. Okay. And just give the URL of your website again. Sure. So it's Jennifer Slattery lives out loud. Dot com. Okay, good. Okay. Well, thank you for being with us today. Really enjoyed that. And thank you everybody for listening. Uh, hope you guys all go out and have a good week following God. And I will talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Christian Habits Podcast. If you'd like more help with stopping and starting habits, check out Barb's blog at www.barbraveling.com.